So we continue our series of sermons today uh, entitled Called, and we're looking at uh, different verses in Scripture, especially, especially the New Testament, that, in which it is described how God calls us to certain things. And today we're looking at how God has called us according to his purpose. And uh, purpose is one of those things that we all want in our lives. Why am I here? It's one of the big questions that philosophers spend decades looking at and write tomes on. Why are we here? Is there a point to life? What, why? What's, what's all this about? It's interesting at the moment, uh, probably over the last 10, 15 years, there's been a, a real rise in the creation of zombie films. Any zombie fans here? Anyone? Yeah, we've got a few. Okay, great. I was surprised. No one owns up to that at 9.30. I just... <laughs> I'm sure there are some secret ones. Uh, but there's a, a huge rise in the creation of zombie films. And probably, uh, in fact, it is, the most watched American cable TV program is anyone know? Walking the Walking Dead. Yeah, zombie Zombies are great, aren't they? You know, they're kind of those things that they're neither dead nor alive and you can do all sorts with them and people make all sorts of films about them. But uh, people love them because uh, lots of people say that they're actually a kind of social, political comment on life. That actually, in some way, zombies represent us all. That we kind of go through life kind of just consuming things around us but actually we're pretty pointless. And, of course, the heroes are those who are fighting against the zombies, fighting against that kind of life. And I guess that, in in some ways, most of us can, at different points, identify with the fact that sometimes life can feel pretty pointless. I used to be a a youth leader, and uh, I was a terrible youth leader. Uh, And I used to do this thing with, uh, with the kids to get them to think about life. And I'd get a big um, flip chart, and uh, I'd draw a line from the top, uh, bottom to the top, and the bottom would say, right, you're born there. And then you go to school. Then you do exams. And then you go to university, if you're lucky. Then you might get married, so you get a job. And then you work every single day for the next four decades. And then you might get married, you might have kids, you might have a divorce, you carry on working, you retire, and then there's the slow decline to death. And that is life. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, and in a stark reality, kind of, that is life for most people. I cannot tell you how many people I have buried where I've gone to the family and said, tell me about their life, what did they enjoy doing? Oh, yeah, they, they enjoyed doing lots of things. They, they loved Coronation Street. Okay, great. What else do they do? Oh, I'll tell you what else they love. They love Emmerdale. And their whole life was watching TV. David Letterman, the American TV presenter, said this, that everyone has a purpose in life. And perhaps yours is watching TV. And for some people, that is their life. And life can seem like that. that you're just kind of going through this kind of daily routine. It's, it's boring. It's dull. It's monotonous. You get up, you go to work, you eat, then you sleep, and then you go to work the next day. It is a zombie life. We are neither living life to the full, as Jesus promised, nor you're dead yet. And lots of people find themselves in that place. And so we have this kind of rise in zombie films where people identify that there's a kind of life that we're living that we want to, we want to get out of. Life can feel pointless. We're on that hamster wheel of life, just churning it over and over and over and over and over and getting nowhere. Is that life? Is that life as God intended it to be? And we can look in all sorts of places to try and find meaning to our life, to try and find a sense of purpose, a sense of significance. Because we know that it's only God, who can break into that monotony of life and set us free from that zombie existence. 
We know that, don't we? At least, I hope you do. No one's saying yes or amen to that. Okay? See, God calls us, as we heard in that passage, according to his purpose. God calls us out of the zombie existence into new life. God changes things dramatically. And when I used to do that chart with the kids, I would say, you can kind of break free from that and draw a line separate the moment you meet Jesus. The moment you meet Jesus, everything can change. Your whole life can be radically altered. And that's great for us all, isn't it? We all need to hear that. We all need to hear that Jesus changes that zombie existence. Someone get that phone. So how do we find out what it is, what our purpose is? And I'm sure you're all thinking, well, what is my purpose? What am I meant to be doing with my life? And I want to say to you that actually that kind of question is the wrong question. I do not want you to think about what you are meant to be doing with your life. I want you to think about a different kind of question. See, when in that passage, Paul says that we are called according to God's purpose. The question is, well, what is God's purpose? And he tells us in the very next sentence. He says this. We all know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. See, the question is, what am I to do? It is, who am I to become? And you are to become like Jesus. Your whole purpose in life is to daily, in all things, become more and more like Jesus. Forget whether you're meant to be a a musician or a preacher or a vicar or a teacher or all those kinds. Forget all that for now. Focus on one thing, that the whole purpose of your life is to be like Jesus. See, when Jesus came, he didn't just come to be our saviour. He came and showed us what perfect humanity was like. He was the perfect human being. He showed us what it meant to be fully human. And he lived life to the full. And his promise to each of us is that we might have life and life in abundance. I love that verse. It was the first verse that I ever learned. That Jesus came that we might have life and life in abundance. What is that life like? It's like Jesus' life. It's like the life that Jesus lived. And so God's purpose for you isn't simply about what you do. It is to be like Jesus. In every aspect of your life. In how you handle money, and how you make decisions, and how you treat your kids, how you treat your spouse. How you go about your work. How you go about your shopping. Have you ever shopped like Jesus? That sounds a bit of a trivial thing. If you think it through, it's actually quite radical. Because every time you shop, it's saying something about the values that you place on life. About where your food comes from, who's made your food, who's made your clothes, have they been paid a proper wage, and all those kind of things. Do you think Jesus is uncaring about that kind of stuff? To live like Jesus should affect every aspect of your life. There's not one moment, not one instance of your life that cannot be shaped by Jesus. And our purpose is to grow to be like Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says this, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. Every single day should be another opportunity to become more like Jesus. Alan Hirsch, who's a theologian and a missiologist, says this, that we should all be little Jesuses. 
Is that how you are living your life? See, most of us have the same kind of experience. If you're anything like me, you came to Jesus, and then in those first few years, you grew to be a bit more like Jesus every single day. There was, there was exciting, it was fun, you were learning new things, you were shaping your life, you were changing on the inside. And then one day you realise you can't, you've hit a plateau. It just seems to stop. And you think, well, I'm a bit like Jesus. Maybe that will do. Maybe I'll just settle here. And we might not think that, but the way we act says that. That we just settle. Well, I am what I am now. I'm a little bit like Jesus. That will do. But Paul says that we are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. Ever-increasing glory. There is no stop to ever-increasing glory. We should be continually changing, shaping our life to be like him. And it's interesting, when you think about Jesus' life, in lots of ways, it wasn't a spectacular life. We look back on it now and say, yes, it was, because there's the cross and the resurrection and all those kind of things. But the death of Jesus was pretty normal. It was a normal thing in Roman life. You would walk along most streets, and outside of the town, there would be a row of crosses of people getting crucified. Jesus never wandered very far from his home. Most of the things that we read about in the Gospels are Jesus walking to a place or from a place. He's simply doing the kind of things of life. And yet, in those things, he's living life full of love and compassion for people. He's living life that is holy and righteous. And he's living life that is supernatural. He's living a life full of power and spiritual authority. And it's in the everyday things of life that Jesus lived life. He would sit at a well and wait for someone to draw water. He'd go fishing. He would do the normal things that people did. It was not spectacular. All too often when we start to think about what's my purpose, we're looking for something that is kind of special. Maybe not spectacular, but certainly special. But it was just in the ordinary, everyday things that Jesus lived his life to the full. And it's in the ordinary, everyday things that you do that you are meant to be like Jesus. That you're meant to live his life every single day and to grow like him in every single day. How do we become more like Jesus? Paul gives us the clue. All things work together for the good of those who love him. All things work together. See, the good that Paul is talking about is not that that you might have a comfortable life, an easy life, a wealthy life. We use that, or we misuse that verse all too often. Someone's going through a bad, bad time, and we say, oh yeah, but God works all things for the good of those who love him. In other words, what we're saying is something nice is going to happen to you later on. That's not what Paul's saying here. See, what I think Paul says is the good he is talking about is becoming like Jesus. Because that is the best thing you can ever do in your life. And what he says is that all things can, if you will let them, work towards that goal. That all the things you experience in your life, the good things, the bad things, and the mundane things can all be used by God to shape you to be like Jesus. When we look at that verse, we nearly always focus on, well, bad things. God uses the bad things in life. And yes, he can. He can take every difficult moment that you face and use that to, to shape you to be like Jesus. If 
you will cooperate with him. See, it's a decision, isn't it? In the midst of that bad thing, you have a choice. You get bitter or you get better. All too often, we want to get bitter about stuff. We want to get angry with God. Why am I facing this? How, why, am I do, why is this happening to me? Why are you doing this to me? But in that moment, you have a choice. Can I use this moment to shape my life to be more like Jesus? How can I allow God in to this moment so that my life can reflect the life of my Savior? That's in the bad times. But God also wants to use the good times because it's in all things God works for the good of those who love him. All things. And you know what? I think it's in the good times in our lives that are actually sometimes the most dangerous times of our lives spiritually. Because then we get comfortable. Because then we start to relax. And think, isn't God great? He's blessing me. I don't need to do anything. I'm in a group of, uh, with other church leaders and we meet uh, through Skype every two weeks. And we challenge each other in all sorts of different ways. And uh, uh, the last time we met, we, they were asking me, what's your biggest challenge? And I, and I have to be honest, I said, at the moment, I am loving life. I just, I'm loving life. I'm doing all sorts of things. I'm loving working here. I'm loving Southport. And, you know, and some people might think, what? Really? Sure. I'm loving Southport. There's, I'm seeing lots of friends. My social life's amazing. I'm loving life. And I said, the biggest challenge in that is how can I be like Jesus in that moment? Because I can get carried away with loving life. Because I can think it's all about me. I've done all this. I've made my life like this. And forget that actually it's God who's given it to me. And in that moment, I have to learn how can I be like Jesus in this good time? as well as in that bad time? How can you be like Jesus in those dull, monotonous times of your life? When you're simply going through work and going home and all those kind of things, and we all go through those times. In those times, how can you be like Jesus? What would Jesus be like in those times? See, being like Jesus... It's a huge task. You are going to spend the rest of your life becoming more and more like Jesus. That is your purpose. And anything else that comes out of that is a bonus. Whether you kind of get a sense of your direction for the rest of your life, whether you get a sense of calling, whether you kind of become a musician or a singer or a preacher or a teacher an evangelist, or you give your life into some kind of vocational work, or whatever it is, that's the bonus. But that is not your identity. Your identity is Jesus. It is always all about Jesus. And your purpose is to become like him. One of the things about um, sailboats is that they're dependent upon the wind. But they're not dependent upon the direction of the wind. Because a sailboat can sail against the wind, can't it? It can tack. And whatever's going on in your life, your decision is, how am I going to set my sails? Am I going to simply go with the direction of whatever's happening in my life? Or am I intentionally, deliberately deciding to use everything in my life to try and become more like Jesus? Some of you will know that uh, the first Sunday evening of every month, uh, I'm doing a series of sermons called Grow, in which I'm, I'm thinking through what does it mean to grow as a Christian? What are the things that help us? And early next year, I'm going to give you a tool to help you think through every moment of your life 
what can I use this for to become more like Jesus? But you're going to have to come to the talk. That's a little teaser for you. So the question I want to ask you is this. Where is your identity? What is your identity in? Is it in the things that you do? I'm a vicar. That's my identity. I cannot tell you how many vicars I have met who when they leave the job for some reason or retire or are too sick to carry on, their whole life falls apart because their identity was in what they did and not in Jesus. I have met people who've who've been putting themselves forward for ordination and going through that whole process. It's a difficult process. And that they're living sold out for Jesus. And they believe that God has called them to, to lead church in some kind of way. And when it doesn't happen, I've seen people lose their faith because their identity was in what they were trying to become, not in Jesus. You'll have all seen Christians who suddenly enter into some kind of wealth in some way. And all of a sudden, their spiritual life falls apart because their identity is in their wealth and not in Jesus. Every single one of you will have met people who have gone through a difficult time in life. And it doesn't matter whether they were on fire for Jesus beforehand or not, when they hit that difficult time, everything falls apart. Because their identity was not in Jesus. Where is your identity? Is your identity in Jesus? Or is your identity in the things that you do and what you want to become and what you want to get? You have the choice in that. You have the choice to shape your life around the only person, the only thing in the whole world, the whole cosmos, who can actually give you life in abundance. (coughs) See, when you give your life completely to Jesus and try to shape your life around Jesus, it doesn't matter what life throws at you. Because your identity is in him. That's why, straight after these verses... Paul then goes on with those incredible things about if God is for us, who can be against us? Why? Because your identity is in Jesus, not in the things of this world. Who can separate us from the love of God? Can height or depth or angels or demons or all those kind of things? Nothing can. Why? Because your identity is in Jesus and not in anything else. If your identity is in Jesus then it doesn't matter what the world throws at you. You'll always be in a place where you can discover life and life in abundance. Shall we stand for a moment? Um, uh, Could the um, music group come up? And uh, let's just be quiet for a moment. Let me encourage you maybe to close your eyes to focus on Jesus. Let's just be aware of God's presence here, right now. What I feel God wanting to say to some people is that you've plateaued for too long.
you've stopped growing. And God is calling you back into that place of growth. And some of that is simply a decision. Lord, I want to use everything in my life to help me grow. To help me be like you. Maybe you just need to make that decision right now. But I really feel as well that you know, one of the greatest ways in which sometimes God helps us move on is that he encounters us in a very tangible and real way. He just meets with us. He fills us again with his spirit. And it's a kind of kickstart into growth. And as we start to move into time of worship, I want to invite you if you just know you need that kickstart, that kind of jump start into becoming more like Jesus again and growing, to come and receive prayer. Because there's nothing like encountering Jesus to help you become more like Jesus. You can't just keep him at arm's length and, and hope that in some way you become like him. So there are going to be people at the, to my left, your right, uh, by the windows, who will be available to pray with you. And maybe they could move there now, whoever would like to go and do that. So if you just need that kickstart, but if there's anything else in your life that is going on, it's not just about that one thing. If there is anything in your life that's going on where you simply need the grace and the power of Jesus to come in and to move you on, to shape you and to help you, then come get prayer. Whether that's about sickness or a situation that you're in. We are brothers and sisters in Christ and there's nothing that we should love more than praying for people and asking people to pray for us. That should be one of those things that it's part of who we are. It's a family value of the people of Christ. That we pray for one another in the good times and the bad. So in a moment we're going to worship. And as we worship, let me encourage you to use these guys who are just making themselves available to you. They would love to pray with you. Don't allow kind of pride or any other barriers to get in the way of you receiving something from God today. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship. Lord Jesus, I thank you that every day, we can become more like you. With ever increasing glory, we are being transformed into your image. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in us and shape us. Let us be a Jesus-shaped people. Help us, Lord, to see how every situation we face whether it's good or bad or mundane, can help us to become more like you, can help us discover more about you, can help us discover more of your power and your beauty and your love and your grace. Lord, I pray that you'd lead us out of that zombie existence into life and life in abundance. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together.